And so today we begin looking at the important films of 1952, with a cool double feature, The Lavender Hill Mob and The Man in the White Suit. These two films don't really have anything in common, except they kind of do. Both films were originally released in England within a few months of each other in 1951. Both films were put out by Ealing Studios, and both films star Alec Guinness. Apart from that, though, they are completely different from one another. I just figured it made sense to group them together for this inaugural installment of the important films of 1952. And this is my YouTube channel, and I can do whatever I want. So let's take a look at these two films. First up, The Lavender Hill Mob, originally released on June 28, 1951. Written by Ealing mainstay T.E.B. Clark and directed by Charles Crichton. The Lavender Hill Mob tells the story of a rather meek and disillusioned London bank clerk, played by Alec Guinness, who concocts a rather ingenious ploy to smuggle one million pounds worth of gold bullion out of England by melting the gold and passing it off as Eiffel Tower paperweights. He enlists the help of a fellow lodger at his boarding house, played by Stanley Holloway, as well as two lowlifes played by Sidney James and Alfie Bass. And off we go. They are the Lavender Hill mob of the title. There's no big trick to that. The boarding house is located on Lavender Hill, which is an actual street in South London. And as this film was a hit, I suppose that street is now famous, kind of like the street in Georgetown where Father Karras splatters all over the steps in The Exorcist, or more recently, those steps across from Yankee Stadium where tourists have started making asses of themselves trying to dance their way down them like Joaquin Phoenix. In any case, this movie is over 70 years old as of this taping, and I think we're at least a couple of generations removed from anyone who would have given a damn about Lavender Hill. There are probably more people who associate Lavender Hill Mob with the Canadian rock band of that name than with this movie, is the point I am making. But in any case, this movie was a huge hit in 1951. It is still considered one of the all-time great British films. It shows up on a bunch of lists to that effect. And in fact, until Star Wars came along in the summer of 1977, it was Alec Guinness's highest grossing film at the US box office. I want you to think about that for a minute because Alec Guinness headlined or co-starred in several films before and after this at a steady clip. He was already considered a legendary actor by the time George Lucas snapped him up for the big marquee role in Star Wars. He'd been in Great Expectations, he would go on to be in Bridge on the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago, he played Hitler. But this, this was his biggest hit in the US until Star Wars. And I guess what I'm saying is, I guess he had to be there. Look, don't get me wrong, this is a perfectly fine, entertaining film. It's helped by an ingenious plot and a couple of memorable set pieces, and it's also helped by a mercifully brief running time of about 80 minutes with credits, something positively unheard of 70 years later, where mainstream movies, perhaps in part to justify their obscene budgets and the exorbitant ticket prices, seem to be obligated to run, at minimum, 2 hours and 20 minutes. In any case, this film would not justify such a running time, even if it wanted to. It's just way too thin, and also, and here's what I'm trying to get at, it isn't really that funny. Oh, it's amusing, sure, there's some cleverness, yes, but I didn't laugh out loud, not once. I sat there for an hour and changed, smiling, which is fine too, but this is not in any way a hilarious movie, and it's also not a particularly suspenseful one, because when we get right down to it, these are low stakes, and it makes, in my opinion, a kind of crucial error in being presented through a framing device of Alec Guinness telling his story to a fellow countrymen while sitting at a club in supposedly Rio de Janeiro. We know it's Rio de Janeiro because a waiter comes up to Guinness and speaks what sounds like Portuguese, and there's a lovely young woman named Chiquita, played by Audrey Hepburn. My point is, if you show me right at the start that Alec Guinness is living it up in Rio, then I know that I'm about to watch how that happened, and I know it eventually happened. He did get away with the money, presumably. I don't think this really hurts the film because I don't think it matters. Suspense is not really the goal. Amusement is. Or maybe you're meant to marvel at the cleverness, to enjoy watching these thieves pull off their scheme. Or maybe in 1951, this really was a laugh-a-minute yuck fest. What do I know? It was, after all, directed by Charles Crichton, 
And that name was already familiar to me as the director of A Fish Called Wanda in that movie. Now there's a hilarious classic movie. And it's entirely possible that uh, 35 years from now, some asshole will be talking about it on YouTube or whatever social media platform people are using by then to achieve their Warhol-approved 15 minutes, and they will be sitting there talking about how not particularly funny A Fish Called Wanda is. So times change is what I'm saying, and I'm not 100% sure this movie entirely holds up again, and I want to be clear, I am not saying this is a bad movie, and for fuck's sake, it'll barely cost you an hour of your life to watch the fucking thing, so you may as well watch it. Besides, it has a couple of things that are worth seeing for sure. There is, for example, this really eye-popping set piece that takes place on the Eiffel Tower and involves two people running down the serpentine staircase high above the streets of Paris. I don't know how they accomplished this. There were no behind-the-scenes featurettes on the DVD that I watched, and I don't know that they had Steadicam technology in 1951. In fact, I'm pretty sure they didn't. But for the couple of minutes this sequence goes on, you are up there with Alec Guinness and Stanley Holloway, and the effect is pretty vertigo-inducing. You might even get motion sick. It looks great. It reminded me of that time about a hundred years ago when my uncle took me to the Statue of Liberty. And I remember that right before going up to the crown, we didn't make it to the torch, I don't think you could actually do that anymore in 1984, if ever at all. But anyway, before going up to the crown, my uncle got me a hot dog, because I was hungry and I wanted a hot dog. And so I ate the hot dog, and then we went up the serpentine steps that lead up to the crown, and my uncle lifted me up so I could look out one of those slits that act like windows that you have up there, and look out at the ocean, and isn't that nice? And then we went back down the serpentine steps, and took the ferry back to the mainland, and it was while on the subway ride home that I vomited that hot dog all over the floor and part of the door and part of the pole right in front of the door. And that's, that's what this movie reminded me of while Alec Guinness and Stanley Holloway were running down the serpentine steps for approximately the same distance of a structure designed by the same person who designed the Statue of Liberty. One more thing, a third act twist involves Guinness and Holloway attempting to steal one of their gold Eiffel Tower paperweights from a chubby little schoolgirl who can't be older than 11 or 12. Now during this chase, she strolls over to a police academy museum to see her, as the film calls him, boyfriend. Yeah, boyfriend is on shift inside, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like that. And then I am a bit perplexed to discover that this boyfriend is a bald man in his 40s. And she gives him the paperweight and leaves. And even he refers to her as my little girlfriend. So I guess I'm sitting here going, what does he mean? I mean, I know British English is different from American English, but isn't this confusing? Or maybe this guy is supposed to be younger than the age I ascribe them, but how much younger exactly? Because he sure as shit does not look to be 12 or 13, or even 15. And maybe this too is an aspect of the time, since Alec Guinness was 36 when he made this, but he looks to be a man of at least 50. Okay, and now on to The Man in the White Suit, which was released on August 10th, 1951, barely six weeks or so later. It was written by John Dighton, Roger McDougall, and Alexander McKendrick, and directed by Alexander McKendrick. This is considered also one of the great British films of all time. It also shows up in a bunch of lists. In fact, it is also considered one of the great British sci-fi films. That last one, that perplexes me. I mean, you have to apply a pretty broad definition of science fiction as a genre for it to be appropriate to this, and maybe I'm splitting hairs. In the end, I suppose the very fact of it fictionalizing scientific concepts makes it a science fiction film, but I guess my point is, this is not what I think of when I think of science fiction. That's not the genre I would fit this in. Comedy? Sure, I guess. I mean, again, it's not particularly funny. It's even less funny than The Lavender Hill Mob. An adventure? A caper? Maybe, I suppose. In very moderate, near non-existent doses, there is some semblance of, let's call it, peril. Suspense. Kind of. The climax of the film does involve a series of escapes and a chase. But more than anything else, I think what I would call this is a socially conscious fantasy. A conscientious social satire. Social commentary about the reality of post-war England. And it's honestly quite good in that respect. It's a bit insufferable at first, because it takes about a half hour before you even realize what the movie's even about. But here's the thing, it's actually about something. And that makes it maybe just a little bit better than The Lavender Hill Mob. Certainly more vital, important, more worth your time. And again, we're not talking about a lot of time here. 
This thing runs about an hour and 25 minutes with credits, maybe even a few minutes less than that. It feels longer because of that wonderfully deliberate 1951 pacing. But time is time. Even if you feel like you've been sitting there for the better part of an afternoon, you've barely been sitting there for an hour and some change. It's fine. Have a sandwich and a coffee. Alec Guinness plays a janitor at a textile mill, but it turns out this guy is a genius, and he has figured out a formula to create fabric that can never get dirty or wear out. Something about molecules and atoms and I don't know what else, and okay, I guess that's why they call this a science fiction film. But you see what I mean? You see what I'm saying? Let's be honest, do you consider War Games to be a science fiction film? I don't, but do you? The computer system presented therein and the artificial intelligence are all based on a real concept, but isn't it a stretch to call War Games sci-fi? And okay, let's go a bit closer to what this is. Would you say The Computer War Tennis Shoes is a sci-fi film? Would you say Now You See It, Now You Don't is a sci-fi film? Both of these, by the way, are Disney adventure fantasies from the 1970s, which starred a very young Kurt Russell. And sure, I guess there's an element of sci-fi to them. And to be fair, my memory is somewhat shaky, but I'm pretty sure they focused more on their science than this does. And maybe since it spends about 15 or 20 seemingly interminable minutes actually talking about the particulars of its science, particulars about which I can assure you you won't give a shit, and this is assuming you can even understand it, but maybe that alone is enough to warrant this, the label of science fiction film. But the movie is not really about the science. That's irrelevant. Ultimately, the white suit of the title is the MacGuffin for the movie to make a comment about the socioeconomic realities of England after the Second World War. It does something very interesting, in fact. It kind of subverts the expectations of the underdog story. You see, we're supposed to be rooting for Alec Guinness's character in this film. Or are we? Under normal situations, wouldn't we? Because he is the underdog. He is a working class man of humble means, but great intellect. And he invents something clearly extraordinary. The manager at the textile mill is at first thrilled they would make a killing with invincible fabric such as this. But then, the powers that be decide it would be best to suppress it. Because although sales would go through the roof at first, there would come a time when, blessed with an unbreakable, untarnishable fabric, people would purchase it in lesser and lesser quantities as demand would go down. Once everyone has enough suits they can wear again and again without washing, they wouldn't need to buy anymore. And what are the working class from which Guinness came? The laborers. Once they've done the job of milling a certain quantity of fabric, their services would no longer be required, would they? And what of the tailors, who make but also mend suits? And what of the old lady, whose only source of income is the weekly washing she does for her neighbors. I have to be honest and admit this aspect of the film really got to me. I found it very interesting. Because who's right? And isn't it interesting that the hero of the story is ultimately kind of a self-absorbed dick? All he cares about is his invention. He pays no mind to the consequences of that invention. Guinness is, of course, great in the title role. He projects intelligence, complexity. These qualities make him rather likable when he really shouldn't be. The film co-stars Joan Greenwood as the mill manager's daughter. Greenwood is lovely in this film. She's lovely and has a very intriguing husky voice that some people might find very sexy. And she looks kind of like Benny Hill in drag. Okay, maybe that's a mean thing to say. Please don't call for me to be canceled yet. Anyway, I did say she was lovely, didn't I? And she is. You know who she looks like? She looks like Emily Watson, who also resembles... Benny Hill in drag. Anyway, good film this one is. It has good performances and a nice tight construction as the story spins towards its ironic and wholly appropriate conclusion. Fans of Hammer Films and Tim Burton's Batman might be pleased to catch a young Michael Goff as one of the rich assholes that want to suppress Guinness's invention. Basically, if you were to only watch one of the 1951 Ealing comedies starring Alec Guinness, I would tell you to watch this one. No, it isn't particularly funny, no, it isn't particularly exciting, and no, it is not, in my view, remotely a science fiction film. Not in the way I see it, not in the way you see it. I don't care what you say. But it is an intriguing film with something truthful to observe about society. It will make you think, and it might even stay with you. And that's that. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you follow me along on this journey as I go through the important films of 1952. Go ahead and give me a like, hit subscribe, and hit that bell so you can be notified of new videos. There's also a Patreon link if you want to throw me a couple of bucks, and thanks for your support. 
I'll be back in a day or two with the greatest show on earth. Is it? We'll see. See you then.